Mrs. Snarky, and it's another installment of Will I Ever Be Good Enough, diving into that book by Carol McBride. And uh, why don't you tell us all about your channel, Snarky? I'm Mrs. Snarky, and I do the snark. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I do politics, philosophy, social issues, psychology sometimes. Um, basically just whatever I feel like. It's, it's, yeah, it is what it is. I don't know what my life really is, but we'll stick with that. Okay? I don't think we, I don't think any of us do. <laughs> like, yeah. Why is what life? Are, yeah, what is life? Why are people? Why are I don't people? Know. Uh, but yeah, definitely check out Mrs. Darky stuff. All of her links are in the bio. There's links to her YouTube, her Twitter, her Redbubble, where she sells her beautiful artwork. Um, so definitely take a look at those. Oh, and uh, her merch shop. So Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, but today we are into chapter two called The Empty Mirror. The quote, an adult woman can hunt for and find her own value. She can graduate herself into importance, but during the shaky span from childhood to womanhood, a girl needs help in determining her worth, and no one can anoint her like her mother. That's by Jan Waldron, giving away Simone. When you yeah. grow up... <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, and we kind of, we miss that help. Yeah. It just wasn't there. Yeah, you have to have some sort of guidance, mm -hmm. right, into um, how you find yourself, how you determine what's good, what's bad, and things like that. And yeah, when you don't have that guidance, it's pretty, it's, it's a difficult path. It really is. Walk. It definitely is. Uh, and then the first paragraph I have. Uh, when you grow up in a family where maternal narcissism dominated, as an adult you go through each day trying your hardest to be a good girl and do the right thing. You believe that if you do your best to please people, you'll earn the love and respect that you crave. Still, you hear familiar inner voices delivering negative messages that weaken your self-respect and confidence. Every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Every day running from the voices. The second one kind of goes over some of the negative internalized messages that you mm -hmm. receive uh, when you're when you're raised, you know, in an environment devoid of any real guidance uh, other than please mama, gotta please the mama. Mm -hmm. If mama ain't happy, then we still don't know what makes mama happy, but. I mean, because nothing really does. And nothing so, is going to either. Like, no matter what we do, it wouldn't have been, like, the ultimate thing. <laughs> nope. Never, never good enough. So, uh, it says, if you are a daughter of a narcissist mother, you likely have heard the following internalized messages repeatedly throughout your life. I'm not good enough. I'm valued for what I do rather than who I am. I'm unlovable, etc. But uh, yeah, because you have heard such self negating messages year after year, messages that are the result of inadequate emotional nurturing when you were little, uh, you feel emptiness inside, a general lack of contentment. You long to be around sincere, authentic people, but you're hard to find. Yes. Uh, you struggle with love relationships. You fear you will become like your mother. Oh my oh, god. So I, I actually have a note attached to that one. Oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I've got lots of notes in here about that one, but uh, yeah, there's just not room on the page, really. No, and I only had a short, short blurb because I'm, I'm not a mom, um, but yeah. it was just that I would fear even babysitting like I was af so afraid that I would damage them or or do something to make them feel the way that I would feel with my mother right and even if you aren't a mom yourself you still have relationships you still have that right. dynamic between other people that you know those kind of narcissistic traits can come out and you know you worry about 
that, whether you're going to do damage to other people like your mom did to you mm-hmm. uh, and me. Uh, <clears throat> you worry about being a good parent or cat parent or dog parent <laughs> or, you know, just a caretaker in general. You have great difficulty trusting people. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. Oh, that one cuts deep. Mm-hmm. And you feel you had no role model role model for being a healthy, well-adjusted woman. And that feeling right there is freaking so true, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if you're raised by a narcissist, you really don't have a role model. No, and I constantly have issues where I suddenly will stop and go, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Like, it, w- it will just hit me and I'll be like... Oh, I need to ask mom. Oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she wouldn't have been able to answer even if she was still around. Right. And I need to figure out how to be an adult, uh, yeah. a decent person, a decent woman on my own. Yeah. And, you know, whenever you have the dynamic where you're a little kid and you're you're trying to learn right from wrong and how do you act you know as an individual if you don't have that guidance then you're just completely lost and you're not prepared for all the decisions and all the choices that uh being an adult comes with mm-hmm. so definitely and uh <clears throat> also you you sense that your emotional development is stunted and yes definitely it took me years just to figure out how to have a healthy relationship and i still struggle with it from time to time it's kind of a learn as you go learn on the job kind of thing yeah and that's not as good as when you have all that childhood training Mm -hmm. so yeah i'm the same way and i'm I'm actually going through like a really bad bout of depression right now probably due to medication changes and like my my normally i can handle somewhat of emotional stress but even then like that's what's going to make me cry first it's not my physical pain um that will make me cry it's the emotional and i've spent the last two days crying my eyes out (laughs) so Yeah, and that's, honestly, whenever we've been through the things that you've been through with your parents and, you know, the lack of guidance and things like that, you don't know what to do with those emotions. You don't know how to cope mm-hmm. with such things. So, yeah, it's it's trial and error, you know? And, uh, yeah, those feelings are perfectly valid. And, uh... It's just going to take longer for those of us who have lack of guidance to figure out, you know, how to deal with things in a healthy way Mm -hmm. and how to even accept the feelings, right? Because you feel the feelings and you're like, oh, I want to reject this because you're so used. Or just stopping. Like when, when I was crying yesterday, I'm like, oh, you're such a crybaby. You need to quit this. You need to stop this. And then in the back of my mind, I heard probably from this very book, feel the feelings. Yes. No, like let yourself cry. Allow that because that is what's going to help you process it, not just shoving it down more like you did growing up. Yeah. And only if you if you shove down your emotions and you just kind of let them build, they're going to explode. They're going to come out one way or another. So they might as well come out in the way that's natural. That's, you know, okay, I feel the feeling, I react to the feeling, I go through the feeling and try to understand what is at the heart of it. And uh, that's, there's a lot more going on, even just things that subconsciously happening that you're not even aware of, that you're working through Mm -hmm. uh, underneath the surface. So it, it is very important to feel your feelings it really is uh okay so you have trouble being a person separate from your mother definitely Mm -hmm. because when you're defined in the mirror of your mother (laughs) then you really have this uh lack of identity 
Right. Um, You're just an extension. Right. Yeah. Um, you find it difficult to experience and trust your own feelings, which is Hell yeah. <laughs> very, that one cuts deep as well, because when you're raised by a narcissist, a lot of times, you know, it's like you were talking about your feelings and those voices that come back to you to negate those feelings. You, you can't even experience that because you've got this negating voice in your head from uh, your own mother who was, oh, you're being histrionic. That's what my mom would say. You're just being histrionic, you know. Mm -hmm. You know I love you, et cetera, and so forth. Oh, quit so, being dramatic. Yes. <laughs> Yes, exactly. So, you know, after being told that for so long, you start to kind of, be you start to believe it. That's mm -hmm. just how it works. All right. You feel uncomfortable around your mother. Fuck yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't anymore. I'm, but, uh. Oh, jeez. Starbell. <laughs> there she is. Oh, oh shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> I spoke too soon. Run! <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my lord, no, it's the it's the UPS. Now I can hear it. Thank you. UPS man. Yeah. <laughs> they the never truck. ring the bell. Like, there are so many times that they'll drop packages off and just leave them there. Yeah. And we have no yeah. indication. <laughs> But when you're recording, see, that's, <laughs> that's the best time to do that kind of thing. Uh, anyway, moving on, um, you find it difficult to create an authentic life of your own, which of mm. course goes back to this uh, extension of mom dynamic. Uh, so yeah, even if you experience only a few of these things, that's a lot of anxiety and discomfort to carry around. As you learn more about the mother-daughter dynamic associated with maternal narcissism, it will become clear to you how you came to feel as you do. And that's another reason why it's important to stay with those feelings. Don't, mm -hmm. don't stuff them down because uh, that's your way of learning more about the dynamic. And that's important for you to heal. Right. And I found a big question with um, dealing with those feelings is why? Like, stop in the moment and go, okay, why do I think this way? Like, what do I think is going to happen if I do X, Y, Z? Right. And processing that and either, you know, looking up some coping strategies with that or talking to my psychologist to being like, hey, I react to this situation in this way. What can I do? Right. That's always very, very helpful is finding co coping mechanisms and trying to find a way to talk mm -hmm. in a way that people can understand. Right. <laughs> anyway, I'm having one of those days, too, where I'm just stuck in a fog and I mm. just, it's really difficult to navigate. But, um, Well, thank you for being here. <laughs> well, of course. Of course. This is important. And I, we, I've missed so much because of sickness and just awful things that have been going on and I hate that but I'm here now yay <laughs> yay so let's take a look at these 10 mother-daughter dynamics associated with maternal narcissism which I refer to as the 10 stingers to help us better understand how these dynamics get played out in real life I've illustrated them with clinical examples from my practice as well as instances from popular culture um, the 10 stingers um... One, you find yourself constantly attempting to win your mother's love, attention, and approval, but never feel able to please her. And one part that I highlighted here, beginning early in life, it's important for children to receive attention, love, and approval, but that approval needs to be for who they are as individuals, not who the parents want them to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, any parents out there that are thinking, you know, that are parenting in this way, in, in a way that is more centered about around your own needs instead of your kids' individual needs, maybe you should stop. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Uh, but yeah, it's, that's kind of the way, that's the story of my life growing up, was just everything had to do with my mom and dad. Like, what they needed, if they needed dinner, or if they needed to go here or there. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. They needed me to act this way or what another way or yeah, it <clears throat> it got to where I was just like I knew I was acting. Oh yeah. Yeah, you have to you put that mask on and that mask changes based on your parents' current yeah. mood. <laughs> yeah, and I kind of I went through this phase, it was ridiculous, but I wanted to kind of test out what if they would even notice what I was doing. And so I spent one day just crying all day. And then the next day I was laughing at everything. And then what is going on? We're so confused. I was too, but <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I it was at that point that I realized that I was about 10 or 11. Hmm. And uh, I realized that I was just living through them, that I had absolutely no life of my own. And mm -hmm. my life was just about them getting attention and approval from them. And I never got it. No matter what mood I was in, no matter right. what I did. <laughs> so it was quite revealing. Yeah. It was an experiment. I bet. I bet. I only ever heard anything if I was in the wrong mood. Typically that would be in public. Um, oh, so if geez. you were unhappy or uncomfortable or even in pain, it was put a smile on your face. Act like you're happy to be here. Oh. And it's like, you're not always happy though. Like, But that is so ingrained in my head that like, even when I'm feeling horrible um, if I do something like this for a recording or do on or less nerve or what's happening, I am much more upbeat than I would be if I was just sitting in on the couch. <laughs> yeah. So, and it Definitely. does help. Don't get me wrong. It is therapeutic to do these shows, but there's still a degree of acting that I put on in any kind of public setting. Oh yeah, definitely. And you know, I know that there's going to be that one person out there. Well, everybody does that. Well, yeah. Yes. But, but I mean, when you're raised in this way where your individual needs aren't being met and they don't matter and you know that they don't matter, or at least you get the sense that they don't, then the problems are exacerbated. The masking is exacerbated mm -hmm. and you, you feel like you're not even allowed to be who you are. Mm -hmm and feel what you feel and be authentic and that kind of thing is not healthy. Yeah, so. and typically what I see is that people who are raised in this sort of dynamic are the first ones to ignore their actual feelings and their actual needs um, to their detriment, to health detriments, physically, emotionally, psychologically. <laughs> yeah, it gets to be too much. They, we push ourselves to to do things and yeah it could it could be too much there is such a thing as too much yes, okay there it is. so the next stinger here your mother emphasizes the importance of how it looks to her rather than how it feels to you and there's a quote here at the beginning it's much better to look good than to feel good mm hmm and this was a thing that was constantly pushed onto me. Uh, the fake it till you make it. You gotta dress for success and all the other um, maxims like that that are really, I mean, on some level, yeah. On another, if you're ignoring, you know, things that you should be paying attention to, then it is detrimental. Mm -hmm. um, it also says here, uh, how you look and act is important to her only because it reflects her own tenuous worth. Mm -hmm. See, that's what it's about. It's not about you. It's about them. It's always about the narcissist. Mm -hmm. So whenever you are not on display and can't be seen by others, you become less visible. Sadly, how you feel inside is not really important. And that's... Uh, I, I think we talked in a previous episode about how whenever we would uh, talk to our mothers and try to get attention from our mothers or something like that, 
you know, it would be a big old uproar, and then the phone would ring, and hello. Yep. You know? Yeah, we covered. Yeah, that that mood switch just on a dime. Yeah, because it's more important how she looks to other people than what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. So, and you, as an extension of her, have to look good because it reflects on her. Right. Yeah, um, the story I have here is kind of a, a tough one, but um, I was getting ready to go to a dance at like 16 years old, and um, my sister had done my hair, I had some makeup on, and a dress, and Randy, her um, boyfriend at the time, I guess, um, looked at me and said, oh, you look sexy. And, like, my stomach just dropped, and I'm like, I don't know how to react to this. So I just didn't say anything, and I brought it up to mom, which I shouldn't have done, but I said that made me feel really uncomfortable. Um, and it's kind of gross. And she said, oh, he, he doesn't have kids, so he doesn't know how to talk to kids. He was a cop. So I'm pretty sure he knows what would and wouldn't be appropriate to say to a 16 year old. Ew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just ew. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. I'm just I'm kind of taken aback by that. That's ew. Mm -hmm. And she oh. would constantly be like, oh, well, give him a hug. Tell him you love him. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but I don't like I don't want to do these things. Why would you want to hug the guy that was all like, you're so, oh. Yeah. At 16, yeah. And then when I was an adult, um, he, because I was talking about like being vitamin D deficient, um, mm -hmm. which is a, like a constant problem with me. And he's like, well, you can just, you know, sit out in the sun. You can come sunbathe over at my house. And I'm like, fuck no, I'm done. Like, you're cut out of my life. I don't care what the fuck mom says. Ew. You're done. Yeah. Oh, God. Ooh, I'm still processing this. Fun times, yeah. <laughs> really, yeah. really great yes. story. <laughs> Holy shit. Well, all I know is, like, anytime we would go anywhere together, it was always scrutiny. You know, You're going to wear that? Are you sure that goes mm -hmm. with that? And, oh, just. And I was always helping her with her makeup. I had to help her with her makeup mm -hmm. because it was really important and yeah anyway <laughs> yeah my mom never left the house without makeup yeah mine did but only because like those were the days where i wasn't there or something mm -hmm. so yeah that became a thing Jeez. yeah well i, I guess with those stories that kind of ties into <laughs> your mother is jealous of you. Yes. Now, um, I looking back on it, huh? Oh, it's so weird. It's so freaking weird because you know my parents were both kind of awful mm -hmm. in their own in their own way, right? And. My dad was really just so mean to my mom. He was always putting her down. And mm -hmm. so anytime I would cook something, he would compliment my cooking. And say, oh, why can't you do it this way? And, you oh. know, she's doing it that way. And you should know that. And she's just a <sighs> kid and blah, blah, blah. And I, I think... Because, like, after the divorce and everything, it was supposed to be, you know, good for the relationship between mom and I. But instead, she just kind of just did her own thing. And looking back at it, I kind of, I suspect that there was some jealousy going on. Mm. Because of... You know, the, the comments and stuff that my dad right. would make. That's so much pressure to put on you, too. Yeah. And at the time, it was like, I was really young. So, it, if I got any kind of good praise, I was like, yay! Yeah. You know? Right. Um, and that was 
Yeah. I didn't realize what was going on, really, until mm -hmm. I was older. But yeah, um, it also says here, a narcissistic mother can be jealous of her daughter for many reasons. Her looks, material possessions, accomplishments, education, and even the girl's relationship with her father. There you go. So, yeah. Yeah, I have a, a note on the following um, where it says, This jealousy is particularly difficult for her daughter as it carries a double message. So we have the do well so that mother is proud, but don't do too well or you will outshine her. Mm -hmm. um, and throughout high school, she always said that her anxiety made it so that she couldn't come to anything. Um, and I was in like color guard, so we were in the marching bands. Um, I was in jazz band. I was uh, FFA, that was a big one for me. And we had a night, it was the, basically like a, an award ceremony and kind of like end of the year thing for FFA. And I was a senior and seniors were featured and basically we had to pick a song um, that was meaningful to us and we had to tell why. And the, the only thing I could think of was if I make this about mom, she'll love me. She'll love me more or she'll, she'll care. She'll pay attention. So that's what I did. I don't remember. I can't remember what song I picked, but, um, she showed up to that, which was the only time that I was focusing in on her. So. Oh, wow. Wow. That is... <clears throat> yeah, it's unbelievable mm -hmm. what you have to do to get attention from right. a narcissist. And, <laughs> and even then, it's like, usually not... I'm pretty sure you got some critique for it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I could have stood up straighter. Um, I could have talked, enunciated more, um, oh, and I was God. just like, like, I'm sitting there going, all I want to hear from you are two words, and that is thank you. That, yeah. That's all I want to hear. Or I even, know. I'm proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Anything. I remember just... she wrote that in my graduation card, but she never really said it to me. Oh. That's heartbreaking. That's absolutely heartbreaking. And then I had another part, um, one of the examples. Felice, 32, told me, my mother always wanted me to be pretty, but not too pretty. I had a cute little waist, but if I wore a belt that defined my waistline, she told me I looked like a slut. And I was, she was talking to me about me and Greg, and she made a comment that I had sex with him on the first night I met him, and I'm like, no. Um, my previous relationship um, was the one where I was sexually assaulted, and yeah. I was not keen on that type of situation, so it took me a while. And um, she just said, well, you're lying. You're a slut. And... Oh my god. Yeah. And when I was, I was like 12 or 13, I was coming down the stairs and we had really steep wooden stairs. It was my grandmother's house and when she passed away we moved in. And I tripped and ended up falling from the top of the stairs down to the bottom and I grabbed, somehow I grabbed the railing and pivoted around and like slammed my head into the wall pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And um, like three days later I woke up and threw up after breakfast but felt fine. And she goes, are you pregnant? Oh my god. I was 12. So I looked oh at her, god. and this was the only time that, well, one of the only times I was snippy back to her, and I said, I read somewhere in a book that you have to have sex to become pregnant. And she scoffed at me and said, well, I guess we'll see. And she took me to the doctor, and the doctor's like, you have a concussion. Yeah. I was about to say, that mm -hmm. sounds like a concussion. Holy shit. And I said, I told you I wasn't pregnant. And mom goes, yeah, this time. 
What in the hell? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I'd want a snacker. I did. I wanted to <laughs> so bad. Oh, that's awful. But Jesus. no, Mom, I'm not pregnant at 12. <laughs> but thank you for the vote of confidence. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> All right. So the next one. Your mother does not support your healthy expressions of self, especially when they conflict with her own needs or threaten her. Mm -hmm. And uh, one portion I highlighted here was uh, they do not encourage what their daughter truly wants or need. Uh, this can even extend to a daughter's decision to have a child of her own. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> consequently, how do, when you do have a child, or if you do have a child, uh, it kind of can bleed into that, you know, are you do, are you raising them the way I approve kind of, mm -hmm. uh, which is just really super annoying and confusing because if you've been raised in that kind of environment, you have no idea of like what to do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's even worse, right? When you're raised, I mean, when you become a parent or you become a caretaker, or you have any kind of responsibility over another person or being, it's, it's, <laughs> you seriously are like, oh my God, this is a lot, right? Mm -hmm. But when you have the added pressure of not being raised in an environment that was healthy and not having that autonomous sense of self, then it's even exacerbated. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. Yeah, okay. the, the first one um, where it says, In the movie, Terms of Endearment, the family is at the dinner table when the daughter announces that she is pregnant. Her mother screams and runs from the room, saying that she is not ready to be a grandmother. Clearly, the daughter's pregnancy is not about her. It's all about her mother. <laughs> I'm and, not ready to be a grandmother. I remember that part. I don't uh, think I've seen it. It's a good, it's a pretty good movie. Um, yeah, my yeah. sister ended up, um, it was her first kid. And it was mom's, I believe, third grandchild. But Jenny, <laughs> I love the way she announced it, too. She goes, I have a parasite. <laughs> and I was like, what? You're pregnant? And I was, like, so excited. And um, mom just looked at them and said, how could you let this happen? Oh my god. And Brad, Jenny's boyfriend at the time, goes, well, I guess we have to have a discussion here and talk about the birds and the bees. Um, <laughs> so that was, that was hilarious, but uh, Jenny left crying because mom reamed her out for I don't even know how long, but... Um, oh, poor Jenny. That's yeah. Wow. And I got yelled at later for being happy about it. <laughs> oh, how dare you have your I know. feelings. Holy shit. Uh, but yeah, whenever whenever I got pregnant, my mom was actually happy. She hugged me, and that was like the last hug I think I got. Uh, oh, boy. But, yeah. And um, so, yeah, after I had the baby and everything... Um, Anytime they would cry, I would want to go in there and, you know, hold them or take care of them. And mom was like, no, you got to let them self soothe. Mm -hmm. You got to let them cry it out. If you come running, they'll train you. They'll train me. <sighs> to, yeah. uh, to, uh, what? <laughs> mm hmm. <sighs> yeah, it's, it's training is what they want. They want their child to do what they want when they want. It's not this yes. give and take. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, um, <clears throat> number five, in your family, it's always about mom. Of course it is. Mm -hmm. Because narcissists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I have, um, the last bit, well, on, on my page, probably not yours, but uh, the it says, In other words, it didn't matter what important things were going on in my life at the moment. It was all about what she wanted me to do, which was visit her in this example. And um, <laughs> they, 
the doctor at one point recommended an at-home caregiver for mom because of her fractures in her back and not being able to get dressed or get in the shower or feed herself. Um, and mom said, well, that's what I have her for. And I was, I was sitting there. Oh. And the, the doc said, but I'm sure your daughter has a life of her own. And mom said, no, she's disabled. And the doc tried to tell her that that means that I am not able to take care of myself, let alone her. Right. But she insisted and said she would only allow it if it was me. Oh my god, what mm -hmm. the hell. Even though insurance, she qualified for, for having an actual nurse come out. Mm. That's ridiculous. Why mm. would you... Why? Oh my god, mom, come on. Mm -hmm. Ugh. But, uh, so... So when my mom was sick, uh, there at the end, she, uh... And she, it was always, like, it was so difficult to tell when she was actually in pain and when it was just her being, you know, um, look at me and all this. So, after a while, it was kind of like, you know, I already had a kid, I was, you know, working, I was doing all this other stuff, and I just, I was like, okay, you know, and she said, well, you know, I'm in a lot of pain and I need to go to the hospital, which is something she said every week. So I was like, mm, whatever. And uh, and I feel bad for it because she was actually in pain at this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, she stormed out of the house and took the only car, right? And drove herself to the hospital and didn't come back. Mm. And I wasn't able to get up there to right. even, like, you know, do anything. And she would call the house and just scream at me because I wasn't there. And I'm like, Mom, you took the car. What am I supposed to do? Right? And, you know, I couldn't go to work. I couldn't go get diapers. I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, but it was always about her. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't about, you know, the situation that she had me stuck in. It was right. about uh, what she was going through. And she was going through things at that mm -hmm. time, but yeah yeah i mean mine was too but like you said there like there were times where obviously she could do what she had just claimed she couldn't yeah um so it just it, yeah it's hard to pick out when things were um important and actually health related or mm -hmm. when it was just i don't want i don't feel like doing it so i'll have my daughter do it yeah it's the mom that cried ouch Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. All right. So, number six, your mother is unable to empathize. Which ding, is, ding, ding. Well, Yeah, usually. Uh, when a daughter grows up with a mother who's incapable of empathy, she feels unimportant and her feelings are invalidated. So, that kind of goes back to a lot of the issues that we have in just dealing with the feelings that do arise and, mm -hmm. you know, giving them room to be dealt with um, and felt, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's that's one thing that's really difficult. And I don't know how it is for you necessarily. I mean, I can go by the way you act and everything, but uh, <laughs> I feel like too much empathy mm -hmm. right I, I feel more uh, about the other people or the, another person than I do for myself and my own needs yeah because that's that's how I was conditioned and whatnot so it's really hard even for me to know what I'm feeling mm -hmm. it, it's in like any when I went to therapy well how does it make you feel and I'm like ah I don't mm -hmm. know <laughs> you just sit there with a blank expression like, feel? Feel? What is what? this feeling mm -hmm. thing? Me? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And even when you do feel the thing, which you do feel it, right? You mm -hmm. don't know how to express it. You don't know how mm -hmm. to, much less deal with it. Um, so, yeah. 
it's anytime I would have a bad day or anything, it was always suck it up, you know, just mm -hmm. put on a happy face and whatnot. Um, but you know, when it was her, oh, the world's ending. Let me just, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. When I had um, the total pancreatectomy with the transplant, um, her entire focus while there was like on her blog. You know, I, I had to post for pictures when she came so she could put it up on the website and be like, look at what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. And the entire stay was around like a month and a half. And like, I, I wanted her to just, I'm like, you don't have to wait out here for me, number one. Like, it's expensive. You're staying in a friggin' hotel. And I, I, um... She she basically made it sound like other parents wouldn't do this for their kids. So, you know, I, I should be grateful that she's doing it for me. And I heard that every night she called um, a friend of the family and complained about every aspect of being out there. And um, the I got released at one point and started having what ended up being withdrawal symptoms, but I didn't know at the time. And I was throwing up everything, even water, um, mm -hmm. diarrhea, fever, shaking. Yeah. And like, as this is progressively getting worse, um, I'm like, we need to call them. I need to go in. And she's like, well, we'll see if this happens or we'll see if that happens. And Finally, I'm like, why can't we go in? And she goes, well, it's really cold out and I don't want to run the car in this. Then I'd have to de-ice it and do all that. Um, but Aww. she said she didn't want to call an ambulance because she said, well, it can't be that bad. Wow. So, yeah, they ended up readmitting me and it they just realized that switching from the IV medication I was getting in the hospital to the dose of, like, the pain med... Um, in pill form just wasn't right for my body, I guess. But, yeah, they said I should have come in sooner. Yeah, de-ice the car, damn it. <laughs> oh, shit. The next one, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Your mother can't deal with her own feelings. Nope. And, um, some of the daughters that she says she spoke to uh, describe their mothers as going stone cold or fading into the woodwork when their feelings are discussed. And that was one thing that <laughs> even my mom proudly called herself cold shoulder because um, anytime she was upset, like really, really hopping, steaming mad, she would just ignore you. Wouldn't answer mm. your calls, wouldn't talk to you, nothing. Just cold shoulder. And, mm -hmm. of course, that's not a healthy way of dealing with your emotions, right? It's no. In relationships. So, yeah, there was that. And there was also, whenever we were with Dad, she just kind of checked out. Yeah. She just wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And when she was there, it was bad. She would explode. Right. And take it out on me. Mm -hmm. uh, because the dad would be somewhere, which was rare, right? But, oh, anytime he would go anywhere, it was just, yeah. All of it was dumped mm -hmm. on me. Oh. Lovely, lovely people. <laughs> Yeah, very lovely. Um, <clears throat> one uh, instance here was uh, the kind of hit home for me, I guess. Uh, Hella was on a wonderful European trip after she graduated from college. She met a guy and was thinking of marrying him. She eagerly called her mother back to the states to discuss back in the states to discuss her feelings. And mom says, "I don't want to discuss this," and hung up on her. To this day, Helen still wonders what her mother was thinking, yet even though Helen is in her 40s now, she never asked her mother about this emotionally charged incident. She learned early in life not to bring up feelings issues. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's one thing, like, any time I had good news, bad news, whatever, 
It was just like, I don't care. But. Yeah. Are you being too emotional? Dramatic. Yeah. Or, or it was kind of her trying to use whatever the situation was to her own advantage. And if she couldn't, she didn't care. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, um, you want to move on to the next one? Sure. Okay. So number eight, your mother is critical and judgmental. Holy shit. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they use daughters as scapegoats for their bad feelings about themselves and blame them for their own unhappiness and insecurity. Children and sometimes adults don't understand that the reason mom is so critical is because she feels bad about herself. So instead of recognizing the criticism as unjust or a product of their mother's frustration, they absorb it. In other words, they, they take those uh, negative things and they assume that it's correct. Yep. I must be bad or mother would not be treating me like this, mm -hmm. for example. So that's one of the things that's really incredibly hard to shake, she says. And that's why the title of the book is yes. Will I Ever Be Good Enough? Mm -hmm. Because uh, those are the kind of things that are reoccurring um, whenever you've been raised by a narcissist. You never do feel good enough. No, and, and every problem that comes up, I my first thought is, it's obviously me, what did I do? And that's not always the case. Like, sometimes Greg's just having a bad day and he's a little cranky. And I'm like, what the fuck did I do? What did I do wrong? He's like, you did nothing. And that makes him more cranky. So it's like this vicious yeah. cycle but that's, that's my first thought it's always my first thought yeah me too um, um go ahead oh i was just gonna say i did have an example uh okay. highlighted and it's Anne related in therapy that she tries hard to be independent but her mother has affected how she views the world and views and feels about herself I'm insecure about my abilities. I always sense that my mother is looking over my shoulder, and if I make the tiniest error, it's like she's there judging me. Everything I do has a piece of what would mom think in it. She's always a voice in my head. And yeah, that voice for me, even with her being gone, um, is still there. Yeah. Same. Um, <clears throat> in fact, even taught, even when I try to do something like just as simple as and relaxing right as drawing something if it's not perfect i can get really upset like overly emphasized upset mm. and angry like one thing somebody recently asked what uh, my least favorite or an emotion that i hated was and it's anger because um a lot of the times whenever I would get that kind of critique, it would aggravate me. It just, for some reason, I had got it in my mind that anger was a motivator. Mm. So if I got angry, I would push through and do the thing uh, <laughs> regardless of what I felt, which is not, um, obviously not a good strategy. Mm -hmm. Because what would end up doing, what I'd end up doing is uh, if I mess up on a drawing and I get irritated because mom's critical crap is still stuck in my head, I would just rip the page or just, you know, start over and it would it would never turn out very well. Lots of broken pencils in my <laughs> life. Um, I bet. <laughs> but yeah, that's not fun. And that's like... Especially when it's something like a hobby like that, that you're doing, like you said, to relax and you're just so critical of yourself that you can't even do that. <laughs> like, yeah. It's stressful. There's no escape in it. Mm -hmm. Sucks. But get out of my head, mom. Right? <laughs> get some sage in there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. The next one. <clears throat> which is a really big one for me. Your mother treats you like a friend, not a daughter. Yeah, it's a huge one. And I, I know that I I've, may have mentioned this time or two, but uh, my mom liked to go to bars, right? And she would take me with her a lot of the time because she would get drunk and somebody had to drive her home. And often that's what would happen. <laughs> hmm. But 
that's one of those things that's not normal. Right. You, you don't you don't take your 14 year old daughter to the bar with you. Mm -hmm. That's she's not your friend. She's your daughter. Mm -hmm. you know, she's not so your sober sitter. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not your designated driver. I don't have a license, Mom. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, can you imagine if you had gotten into an accident, though? I, I know. Like, it, it's it's a good thing I'm an excellent driver. No. Yes. <laughs> well, but, I mean, at that point, I did have a lot of practice. Uh, but, because we went to the bar so often. Uh, but... If we would have been pulled over or something, it would have been just terrible. Oh, and she would have blamed you. Yeah, totally you... would have blamed me. Yeah. Oh, I let her drive. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, this one, when I first read it, um, I didn't... At first I was like, well, she wasn't my friend, you know, because I'm thinking friend is somebody that there's like a mutual relationship with. Um, and then I read the, the blurb, um, in a healthy mother-daughter relationship, the mother acts parental and takes care of the child. The daughter should be able to rely on her mother for nurturing, not the other way around. During the ch child rearing years, the two should not be friends or peers, but because mothers with narcissistic traits usually did not receive proper parenting themselves, they are like needy children inside. With their own daughters, they have a captive audience, a built-in source for attention, affection, and the love they crave. As a result, they often relate to their children as friends rather than offspring, using them to prop themselves up and meet their emotional needs. Sometimes being a supportive friend to her mother is the only way for the daughter to get positive strokes from mom. The daughter may fall into a friend role willingly, not even realizing there's something terribly wrong with the arrangement until much later in life. And it's yep. not until I read this that I was like, oh, yeah, that that definitely happened. Um. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's kind of like for the narcissist, it's like they're stuck in being, emotionally, anyway, as being a toddler. Mm -hmm. Mine, 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 mine. Mm -hmm. It's all about me. You know. Um, but yeah, that's that's a major part of it. Uh, the lack of empathy and things like that also play into that uh, kind of childlike, stunted um, emotional state that the mm -hmm. narcissist is really the struggling with, right? Because it's not it's not fun for them to be narcissists. No, I mean if you can if you can imagine it for a moment, just how empty of an existence and how confusing it would be. Uh, it kind of brings a little empathy into that too. Not mm -hmm. that you should allow them to run you over, but just realize that, you know, they have their own struggles as well. And it's, I don't want to say it's not their fault, but it's one of those things where they, they can't, they can't change who they are. Mm -mm. And this isn't, once again, this isn't about a blaming game, but just an observation of the dynamic that exists and has to be worked through and coped with. Right. So. And like you said, they're not going to change themselves. And some people will be like, well, some of them can. And with a true narcissistic personality disorder level person, um, they don't see what they're doing as wrong. They don't see anything about them that is wrong. So when it's suggested, they don't stop and go, well, maybe the psychiatrist is right and I need to work on things. Most of the time, the people who are helped are not full-blown NPD patients. Yeah. You know, they, they have narcissistic traits, but they're willing to sit down and go, okay, well, let me, let me take a look at this. There's this therapist, you know, or I'm, there's my daughter telling me that something is wrong. Let me look at it. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, these are personality disorders when they are actual, uh, narcissistic personality kind of things. So a lot of the time, it's like you said, they don't know what that there's anything wrong until there is an intervention. And a lot of times it's the law. 
<laughs> a lot yeah. of times they have a uh, court ordered um, psychiatrist come in and go, Hey, what the hell's going on? And um, they find out that way. Um, but yeah. Oh goodness. <laughs> Deep stuff. Right. Uh, number 10, you have no boundaries or privacy with your mother. Um, this was mm -hmm. this was one thing that came to a head when I became a teenager, and it um, I think it was a lot easier for me since my mom was rarely present. There was a lot of neglect, so there wasn't a lot of helicoptering, but when it comes to my relationships and things like that, there was always meddling. Mm -hmm. uh, like I explained last time with uh, my ex-boyfriend and that she told me to break up with. That was definitely mm. pushing the boundary. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't... It was It was like that, too. I mean, she didn't do what, what your mom did, but um, the... Where it says... The, her mother can talk to her about anything, no matter how inappropriate, and tell other people anything about her daughter, no matter how embarrassing. The narcissistic yeah. mother usually has no clue how wrong this is and how unhealthy it is for her daughter. To, her, to the mother, her child is simply an extension of herself. And, like, she would, she would quiz us over everything. Like, if we went on a date, it was basically describe the night from start to finish. What is this person like? What did you talk about? She would tell us, like, who we could associate with from, you know, like, online people or even family members. Um, if a family member disagreed with her, which my sisters did later on, we weren't allowed to talk to them. Oh, yeah. And she would smear everyone who basically was against her. I know when she had a problem with my sister Jenny, she told everyone that Jenny was on drugs. And um, Jesus, Jenny had to post in, in mom's place of employment. She worked in like a convenience store slash bar. She had to post up there a drug test that, that signified negative for everything. Because everybody in the small area where we were at and all the family members all thought she was just on really bad drugs. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is awful. Mm hmm Oh, my gosh. Well, a lot of times, like, a lot of the conversations, like, if I had a friend over or something like that, a lot of times the conversation would be get kind of embarrassing uh, and my friends would think oh she's so cool she can talk about you know mm -hmm. sex and drugs and rock and roll you know but it was like mom you're not supposed to talk about this this is inappropriate mm -hmm. and she just didn't oh stop it now mm -hmm. yeah so yeah that's that's another thing that uh, if you if you don't have any sense of um, this is an, an individual separate from me, then you're not going to take into account that person's feelings. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to push boundaries when, uh, you have a personality like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, the second example with Marion says, Marion's mother violates her actual physical space by using a key to her house and slipping in every once in a while to check up on Marion's housework. Um, or housekeeping, sorry. But my mom, I was smart enough not to give my mom a key, but she would make <laughs> surprise visits to the apartment. Um, if I didn't answer the phone, say I was sick and just didn't want to deal with her, she would show up and, and start badgering on the the doorbell because she knew I was home. Yeah. And it's just like if if I was unreachable at any point, like I would I would hear about it and that shouldn't be you know, if you're if you know your daughter is not like in a life or death situation and she's not answering the phone, leave a message, 
they'll get back to you when they want to get back to you. And they are not <laughs> obligated to get back to you. Yeah, give them some space. That reminds me, too, of uh, when Maddie and I first got married. We lived in the trailer next to my mom's house. And uh, we actually rented it from her because, yeah. Oh, boy. And anyway, um, anytime I would cook dinner... Uh, she would, like, there were a few times where I cooked dinner, I'd be like, oh, this is really good, you should try it out, you know, and I guess she took it as this was going to be every night, because oh. she would call, what you, what you making good over there? Oh, boy. And every day it became like, a, okay, I gotta make a plate for mom, and, you know, it became a problem in uh, marriage, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. yeah. Not uh, fun. I'm sure Maddie will remember that whenever they watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, I forgot about that. It pissed me off because <laughs> I'm, I'm really a pushover and um, I, I like to make things for people. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's kind of like, those are my cookies. Or those are my muffins. <laughs> it's mine. You know? uh, it's kind of cute, but it's also like, stop it now. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> God. Okay, so back back to this stressful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's talk about narcissist, y'all. Right. I'm I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it today. It's all about mm. me. All right. Oh. So but the yeah, next I bit I have highlighted is in Nicole Stansbury's compelling novel, Places to Look for a Mother. She describes the lack of privacy when the mother, oblivious to the daughter's needs, feels like she can walk into the bathroom even while the daughter is using it. The daughter says, you always walk in the bathroom. We can never have locks and you never knock. The mother replies with, no wonder I'm on pins and needles all day. No wonder my nerves are shot. I can't do anything. Can't make a single move without being accused. I don't know what you're afraid of my seeing, what the big secret is. You don't even have pubic hair yet. Oh my god, yuck! Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I can't, I can't, y'all. I just can't. I can't either. Oh. And it says, not only does this mother fail to respect her daughter's boundaries and privacy, she blames her disrespectful behavior on her daughter. That's cool. And it, it was the same. It was the same in our house. Um, no matter what you were doing in the bathroom, mom had to use the bathroom at that time. And it's like, can you just not? <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, I had my own bathroom. Mm. So that wasn't much of a problem. Uh, but yeah. That, mm, God. Yeah, she would just, like, we'd be in the shower and she'd come in and be like, oh, I wanted to touch up my makeup. And it's like, do you need to? And she's like, no, I just wanted to. It's like, fuck you. <laughs> like, you, you don't even have a valid reason to be in here. Oh my god. I never understood it. So ridiculous. Well, I mean, when you're in the shower, you weren't thinking about her. <laughs> How dare you? Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be really weird if I was thinking about my mother while I was showering. Yeah. Well, I mean... <laughs> yeah, think about Mama 24-7. It's all about Mama. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would Mama think if you weren't thinking about her? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, the next portion is, uh, where am I in the mirror? And uh, it says here, sadly, due to the detriments affecting those of the Ten Stingers, when the daughter of a narcissistic mother looks for her own image in the mirror, she has trouble seeing herself. Instead, her sense of self is merely a reflection of how her mother sees her, which is too often cast in a negative light. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and it also goes through uh, something that I, I think is really important. She says, uh, through each stage of development, daughters can't help but internalize the negative messages and feelings their narcissistic uh, mothers have conveyed over the years. You may have forgotten exact events or emotional traumas, but you've likely memorized the self-defeating messages. Mm -hmm. That's what's important, the message yes. that you mm -hmm. got from it. We daughters carry these into our adult lives. 
They create unconscious emotional and behavioral patterns that cause us problems and can be very difficult to overcome. You can silence these messages once you understand their origin and influence and work to formulate your own healthy beliefs about yourself. You can learn to supplant these negative voices and change your self-image by learning more about how your mother developed her narcissistic behavior. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things, and I always talk uh, rave about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy because it gets to the heart of this issue. It gets mm -hmm. to the, the origin, the thoughts, the feelings that come with it. And... Uh, those thoughts and feelings lead to beliefs about yourself and the world. Mm -hmm. And unless you can get down to those core beliefs, you're not going to be able to deal with it. Okay. And uh, I think that's one of the main uh, issues is trying to, whenever you're trying to overcome uh, anything really, mm -hmm. um, is to get to the bottom of how you're perceiving it and what you believe. Mm -hmm about yourself in the world, especially yourself, when it comes yes. to narcissistic, uh, dealing with the narcissistic mother. Yeah, the self-defeating messages. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have so many of those, and I try, like, I'm trying to reframe that. And it's difficult. Yeah, it really is, especially, like, if you did make a mistake or something and you genuinely messed up, and typically when I realize that, I apologize 50 bajillion times and people are like it's fine move on <laughs> but i just like it's in my head that i will never recover from this right i'm sorry for saying i'm sorry so much. right <laughs> i'm so sorry about that <laughs> yeah I, I do that a lot too and unfortunately my son does that too oh <laughs> and and i'm i'm feeling like maybe uh he's picked up on some of my negative habits mm. from the way i was raised but we're working on it. We're working on it. Uh, that's all you can really do is just find another strategy. And a lot of the times, you know, uh, my main core belief in terms of how my mother trained me to think about myself is that I'm incompetent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <clears throat> it was basically, it comes from anytime we go anywhere, and I'd forget something in the house or something, you know, or I'd burn something. Uh, you just don't know how to do anything right. You'll mm -hmm. always be a failure. You'll always, you know, and the way that I kind of cope with that is I do look to the times when I was successful at something, even if it's something little, it makes a difference. Uh, like, I dried my hair. It's thoroughly dry, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or mm -hmm. I did cook a good meal. Mm -hmm. It was really, you know, delicious, or I did help this person out. So, you know, uh, it has to be honest. You have to be honest with yourself when it comes to this kind of thing. You're not going to believe yourself if you're just like, oh, I'm perfectly great, you know? Right. But that's that's not a core belief that you'd want to hold anyway because mm -hmm. you were raised by a narcissist. And just, no, mm -hmm. you just get to reject that anyway. But, um, you know, even if you make mistakes, which are going to happen, failure is a part of life. Mm -hmm. It's learning to cope with it that is important. Mm -hmm. so, so learn to recognize when you have accomplished something. Even if it's just, I got out of bed today, right. you know, sometimes that's a big deal, especially yeah. if, if you have crippling depression or you're just, you're disabled in any way. I mean, getting out of bed, taking a shower and, you know, mm -hmm. taking care of yourself can be a, quite an accomplishment for the day. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing to remind yourself to celebrate those little victories like that that helps yeah definitely so yeah chapter three is gonna be fun <laughs> right <laughs> that is the faces of maternal narcissism Yay. um she kind of goes over uh what you know examples of certain types of mothers and you know the different types of narcissistic mothers so that'll be yes. interesting to delve into to discuss which one 
our moms were. <laughs> and she reminded me too um, of another movie recommendation: Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. I still I didn't know if that one was any good. That's a good movie. Yeah, you'll like it. Uh, just like White Oleander, a couple of people out there have uh, mentioned that they watched it on uh, my recommendation. It's quite a tearjerker. Mm. So get the tissues out, get ready for the real world, really hard hitting stuff. Because uh, I probably shouldn't do that right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, you should probably wait until you know you're <laughs> in the right state of mind. Mm. But Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood is another one of those movies that is mm. very, very real and uh, very honest, and I and I adore it. It's a good movie. Awesome. Uh, I will definitely add it to my my list. I have a really long list. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Uh, but yeah so that'll be next time and uh, other than that uh, why don't you shell your channel in places out again yay I'm Mrs. Snarky uh, subscribe to my channel I've, I'm taking a month off right now I've got uh, a lot going on <laughs> cars broke down I've also got spring break coming up and I've got to prepare for that. I'm going on a trip. Uh, but I will be back um, sometime in later March, the end of March. So be looking for that. Subscribe to me. Buy my art. Yay! Okay. Yes. And all <laughs> of the links are in the description. Um, so we have YouTube, Twitter, merch shop, art shop, you name it. <laughs> it's in there. And I highly recommend it. Um, her art is very beautiful. I've gotten a, an orchid on a sweatshirt and dragons on a, a notebook. <laughs> so. Thank you. Oh yeah, no problem. I'm glad you like it. But thank you for tuning in and catching another episode of this. We love having you here and I hope that this helps you out there. Uh, but just remember life can be shit. Uh, so let's get through it together. Keep hanging in there with hashtag. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> are the bloopiest of bloopiness. Bloopers. In the corner of our eyes. <laughs> bloopy bloop bloop bloops. Come on, bloop. you stupid thing. Blooping on your head, blooping on your toes. Bloopity bloop bloop bloop. Bloopity bloop bloop. Bloop. Uh, should I keep singing? Because I, my brain stopped. See, if you just kill the landlord. Right? Then, That's then, what we need to do. It would be fine. Connecting. I blame ropes. Hey! Oh shit! <laughs> you blame who? <laughs> ropes Pierre! <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, robe! Wait, just make some changes. Da -da -dun, da -da -dun, da -da -da. That's just the way it is. Things will never be the same. It's just okay. the way it is. We are now like nine minutes in and we've done a paragraph. <laughs> Yay! But I think. Ah, no, I'm still screwing up stuff. Boot scoot and boogie. There we go. Yeah. Okay, I think we're we're okay now. Uh, Yay! Okay. Where did we leave off? <laughs> <laughs> we left off at the first paragraph and uh